So yeah, thank you for having me. I'm I'm really excited to be able to talk about my work uh, that is uh, within the ICAS uh, Cities project, but also part of my PhD. So it's about the mapping of future emissions based on the city's climate plans. Um, I'd like to thank Lisa and all the organization committee, of course, for the organization and the nice exchanges. And also, of course, my uh, supervisor, um, Tumalovo and my colleagues um, from Origins and also from the LSCE. Um, so probably almost all of you uh, know uh, why we do talk about cities. Um, cities are a huge um, part of our world and uh, most of the world's uh, population is concentrated in cities. Um, for now it's more than half, but it's foreseen to be over 70% by 2030. So uh, this impact that cities have on emissions will only be increasing as also urbanization is uh, supposed to increase. But uh, we also concentrate on cities because uh, they're interesting in terms of their uh, closeness um, between decision makers and uh, the residents, local businesses and the institutions. So the policies can be implemented much more quickly and more um, precisely, uh, more decisively so this is one aspect that's very interesting, uh, why to concentrate also in cities. Um, okay, somebody has their mic on. <laughs> Maybe it's better to switch it off. Thank you. Um, so um, for cities, um, what kind of tools they have in order to um, measure, have an idea about their emissions is that um, they usually use what we call um, uh, inventories so they uh, they look at how many um yeah cars they have on the streets or how much energy is used they uh, they time that by an emission factor and they get to uh, emission inventories and um, one study in the US has been done um, by Kevin Gurney and uh, his colleagues where they compared those uh, emission inventories that are um, issued by the city with uh, what they have is an emission um, product um, where they do a kind of a hybrid approach. Uh, I won't go too much into that, but uh, so they compared different approaches of those uh, inventories of how to do the inventories. And there they saw that you actually have kind uh, yeah, kind of big differences between how you can um, go to measure those inventories. So the here, what they saw is that they have a mean relative difference of almost 20% of an underreporting of the city emission inventory. So um, meaning that uh, we do have some uh, emission sources that are lacking in those inventories. So it's usually um, due to um, petrol um, fuel use or some point sources from the industry or commercial sector that really do, um, or maybe also due to um, accounting um, methods, so different approaches that uh, really uh, yeah, drive those uh, differences. But you also have uh, cities where it, uh, the total seems to match. Um, what is interesting, because when you have a look at those um, uh, cities where, so I had this uh, box here uh, where the totals seem to match. So can you actually see my, my mouse? when it's moving? We can see it. Oh, great. <laughs> so um, then, uh, so you have in the black line, uh, the totals. So you can see here, they're really small. So I'll just put this away. Um, so here you have a zoom into those. And for example, for Detroit, you have a very small um, difference in the total of the two um, inventories. But when you have a look at the um, sector scale, then you can see actually that there are really large differences and they are just um, compensating one another. So it's the, uh, it's the road uh, sector compensating the stationary sources. And so it seems that the total is matching, but actually it's, uh, it's just opposing uh, differences in, in the sectoral uh, level that's really uh, driving or is seemingly uh, having the total uh, match. So that really nicely in illustrates the lack of accuracy and precision when we talk about total emissions. And 
that really makes it difficult to prioritize um, mitigation policy options. Um, you have already scarce resources that you need to allocate wisely, um, which is of course difficult in that kind of um, um, challenge. And um, so it's really interesting to see if cities are really on track um, to follow their plant emission reduction targets and if the trends are really um, where we think um, they should be. Um, so this is a kind of a why um, this you know, ICA Cities a project. Um, yeah, the the founding one of the founding ideas at least uh, for the cities ICA ICA Cities project, um, which is also um, goes align with a you can't manage what you can't uh, measure. So. Um, here we have one of the world's um, coordinated uh, network that is um, including 15 um, cities from 13 different countries in Europe. Um, I, uh, you also have three pilot cities besides uh, the 12 other cities. Um, I chose in that study what I will be presenting to you um, to concentrate on Munich and also on Paris. And the idea behind that project is to really see um, how we can compare different uh, measurement approaches and how to provide to turn that into something that's uh, that's applicable and that provides really services for decision makers in order to to drive that and that mitigation actions and to to support their their decision making. Um, so here you can see the the setup of a. Uh, of the atmospheric concentration networks, how it's a, uh, yeah, planned to be. Let's say. Um, so um, what's interesting is that um, here you can see what really is planned. Um, for example, in Munich, you have this really nicely laid out uh, atmospheric uh, monitoring network, which is really um, the theory, right? Um, right now we are confronted with a reality, so. Uh, those kind of setups uh, are only in theory uh, possible because in reality, we are um, opposed to, to uh, uh, getting permissions to install the sensors. We, uh, we don't know if, uh, if it's possible to install them. So it's really more of an op opportunity-based um, installation than really where we want it to, uh, to be. Of course, we do have those uh, studies if it's still applicable. But um, it's more of an opportunity, and we what we do is we consider um, current information. We for now we don't take into account any future information. For example, of uh, how the city will evolve uh, in the future, the urban sprawl, um, socioeconomic developments uh, that are influencing um, THG emissions. Um, and this is something what I was interested in um, to see what would this um, theoretical um, network look like if we would take uh, into account future emission changes and uh, take into account um, those uh, different socioeconomic influences to uh, that are also coming from the city's climate plans to see where will those emission changes be happening. So we were concentrating on, on those three uh, research questions to see if cities are on track to, uh, to meet their climate targets, to um, to know how far cities' um, climate actions plans are influencing the spatial distribution of the GHG emissions and how to link atmospheric networks, what I just told you, um, to those future emission changes and to see how can we or how are we able to track those um, future um, changes with our urban atmospheric monitoring network. So, we started our study with uh, those two pilot cities, Paris and Munich, that you can see here on the left side, it's Paris. Um, you can see that it's a very dense city. It's already overflowing its uh, administrative boundaries. Um, the administrative boundary showing in a black line here. So it's, it's very dense. It's one of the densest cities in, in Europe. And on the right-hand side, you can see Munich also having the black line as a, um, uh, administrative boundary. And you can see in Munich, um, it's triple the size of um, Paris and it still has room to grow. So it's, this kind of information is really interesting to, uh, to take into account. 
to see uh, yeah, how emissions will evolve in the future. Um, so in order to see if the cities are on track um, to, um, towards their climate targets, um, we had a look at their emission inventories. So uh, in, everything in blue is uh, concerning Munich and in red it's about Paris. And so we, uh, we just mapped here um, what the city uh, issued as um, their inventories, where they wanted to, to be. So that's the, the dotted line. This is their climate target. For example, in Munich, they want to be uh, climate neutral by 2035. And then in the dashed line here, you have um, if the climate plan is applied, um, where it would be um, according to the climate plan. So you can see that uh, we do have um, a, an emission gap between what the uh, a climate plan right now, at least, uh, is uh, going to, to bring into, um, into a reduction of their carbon emissions and uh, where the city wants to be. So this is really important to see that, yes, cities are reducing their emissions. So they're, they have the negative trend line, which is very good. Um, but it's not enough yet. So really, we need to increase our efforts in order to get where we want it to be, meaning climate neutrality for Munich 2035, which might be a little over optimistic, let's say. And for example, Paris is more for 2050, trying to reach that uh, goal of climate neutrality. But even there, you can see that we do still have um, an emission gap between where the city wants to be and where um, it, uh, it will be according to um, what's uh, right now the trend. Um, to see how those emissions will be, um, how they look on a spatial um, scale, um, we took uh, for Munich, for example, we took the uh, TNO spatialized uh, one by one kilometer um, emissions inventory. We harmonized that with the, with the city's uh, self-reported inventory in order to, to see how uh, the mitigation actions will be influencing that, uh, that baseline. And so to subtract actually those uh, mitigation actions from that baseline. So we, we needed to do some quantification as the second step in order to be able to, in the third step, have those uh, projected emission maps for 2030 and uh, 2050. Um, of course, this was a, a um, a simplified uh, way to show you what the steps are. This is much more what it looks like. Um, so you can see it's it's really something more than just uh, yeah, subtracting one thing from the other. Um, it is, uh, of course, you can always enhance the study, but um, yeah, for now, uh, for Munich, we, we did uh, quite some, some interesting results. So for example, in Munich, um, for the residential sector, what we did is we had a look at uh, what the, the city issued um, in their local urbanization plan. So we, uh, we saw that they wanted to build um, future residential areas that you can see here in the middle for the different years for 2030 and 2050. Um, and also we took into account the increasing um, population that's foreseen by the city, but by the statistical um, department. And so we put that together and uh, redistributed um, the new emissions for uh, for the residential sector. So what it looks like is uh, like that. So you have uh, the baseline 2019 for the residential area in Munich. Um, then the projected emissions, how it would look like uh, in 2050 if the mitigation actions are applied that are mentioned in the climate plan. Um, between those two, you can't really see, but here um, in the difference map, you can really see that we have a decreasing emissions everywhere, but uh, in those new residential areas where emissions increasing, of course, because we did not have any um, emissions in 2019 in our baseline, but then we have new emissions coming up due to the creation of uh, new residential areas. On the bottom panel, you can see now the, the total emissions from Munich, um, same for the baseline 2019, um, for the projected emissions 2050, if the total of the climate plan is applied. And then the difference map. Um, here, the total emissions are really driven by the change of um, energy source, meaning that uh, Munich wants to um, 
replace its, replace its entire electricity production, which is, for example, here you can see the, the darker red areas. Um, oh, this one, at least, um, is based on coal production, which has been um, foreseen to be switched off. Um, it should have already been switched off. Um, but due to the Ukraine war, um, this has been delayed. And uh, so here I projected it to be um, included in the 2050 um, emissions. So here it should have switched uh, to gas. But ultimately, uh, Munich wants to become uh, neutral and to have only uh, renewable energies on their territory. So the, the decrease in emissions is really driven by that um, energy source. So that uh, study um, was uh, finalized by um, a QGIS um, plugin. Um, I can invite you to, to try and use it. Um, it's really available. Um, that plugin, uh, so it's a QGIS, is a free um, software that um, spatializes, so for example, uh, emissions. Um, and uh, what you can do is we uploaded the, um, the baseline for 2019 or 2020, sorry. Um, and uh, for the two cities, for Paris and Munich, and depending on the city, you, you will see uh, one or the other. And then you can play with it, uh, putting in different scenarios, uh, saying how much uh, uh, emissions will be decreasing for the year 2030, um, um, yeah, in a traffic sector or wherever in a waste sector or whatever. And then you will see, um, You'll have an output uh, uh, options of uh, yeah, absolute difference, uh, relative difference. Um, you have a whole lot of output options, and you you will be able to see those spatialized emissions for the different years that you're choosing choosing to see. And um, yeah, that was one of the uh, deliverables that's uh, coming out from the this, uh, I could see this project, which is uh, quite nice to see that. Um, yeah, cities can play with that uh, scenarization to see where the efforts uh, would have the most impact to um, to target their decisions in the end. For Paris, um, I did not go too much into detail, but um, in Paris, uh, for what's mentioned in the climate plan is that they have what you see here on the, on the left hand side is that they have. Um, targets of relative uh, reductions, meaning that on, on their territory for 2030, they want to halve their emissions and they want to become um, neutral by 2050, meaning that on their territory, they don't want to have any more emissions. Um, if we take into account, uh, uh, yeah, the, the total carbon footprint, so up to scope three emissions, um, then uh, they need to also compensate. But um, yeah, what's interesting is that really they are kind of only working with relative targets. They are not as Munich uh, saying, um, uh, yeah, an action item of uh, of reduce reducing um, the speed limit from 50 to 30 will uh, lead to this and that much uh, emissions decrease. Um, Paris is unfortunately not doing that, but uh, working with those relative targets. And so we wanted to go a step further and uh, do it as Munich and uh, quantify the emission reduction targets and to see what it really would translate into emissions. So here you can see uh, how it would uh, look like if, uh, if the climate plan is applied and if the targets are met. And what you can see here is that uh, the most of the emissions in Paris is really driven by the buildings and the transport sector. So the, the pink, the red, and the, and the yellow. Those are, are really uh, making up almost 90% of the, of the total emissions in Paris. So we concentrated on those uh, sectors. And um, so we had to start to build um, an, an emission inventory to have a baseline. What we did in, in Munich uh, with the TNO inventory. So here in Paris, we had a different uh, approach. We used um, the inventory that was provided by um, the startup Origins Earth. And uh, which is really a, uh, a very um, high uh, resolution um, emissions inventory. It's made up of a whole um, a massive amount of uh, different databases that you can see here. That's uh, 
yeah, through the assimilation of uh, various geometries, the uh, proxies, uh, that data, we're actually, uh, yeah, kind of working with it. And then uh, we will, it will be sectorized, spatialized, and um, time profiles will be applied. And so we also have that uh, temporal variation. Um, so after having that baseline, um, we looked at, into the each of the sectors to um, and uh, try to to see what's the biggest um, impact uh, mitigation impact. And in Paris, for example, they um, in the residential sector they want to renovate uh, one million dwellings by 2050, which uh, comes to uh, about 45,000 um, buildings um, in, from the residential sector to be renovated per year, and uh, this is what they uh, want to put in place uh, in order to, to reduce their energy consumption by one third and uh, by half um, by 2050 um, in order, yeah, to see also the, uh, yeah. I don't know if they want to really see the, the emission reductions. I guess it's what they want to see, but what's interesting here is really they are concentrating only on, on energy and consumption. They are not mentioning any of the, of the emission reductions that could lead, what this kind of measurement could lead to. So um, we needed to, to make that link, um, that yeah, bridge between the energy consumption and uh, emission, GHG emission reductions. Um, so we had a look um, on, uh, on the Paris uh, area where actually we have the most emitting um, dwellings and apartments that are emitting the most. Also because uh, in, in France, you will be prohibited to, um, to rent out an apartment that's, um, that's uh, consuming more than a threshold of uh, 330 um, kilowatt hours per square meter per year. So the renovations should, of course, uh, concentrate on, on those kind of apartments at first. And um, so we mapped them out here and you can see that really inside Paris, it's where most of those buildings are. And you can really see here on the right hand side, the correlation between um, the CO2 emissions, the building's age and the share of the oil heating use that's uh, really driving um, emissions in um, Paris for the residential sector. Um, for the traffic sector, um, what the city wants to put in place is, or what it concentrates on, it's kind of like in the residential sector, they are, they are concentrating on an air quality issue, meaning that uh, they um, that they want to prohibit um, fuel powered uh, vehicles by the year twenty thirty. So we they have now defined that zone. Um, it's kind of a belt around Paris. Um, the belt is defined by that um, by that highway, and uh, within that zone, they applied that calendar in order to um, to take out cars um, that are uh, most polluting, but air quality issues, um, polluting cars, and then um, so it will be prohibited to to drive with those uh, kind of a uh, yeah what they call here crit air. So it's really a classified cars, um, depending on the year uh, they have been constructed, um, depending on, um, on the energy use. So if it's diesel cars or gasoline cars, et cetera. So they are categorized and then they apply that calendar in order to phase out those different kind of categories of cars, uh, starting from the most polluting cars, of course. So what I had a look at is uh, the number of cars um, how it will, um, yeah, um, evolve in the future. Um, so I have uh, the scenario on the top, uh, which is my business as usual scenario, um, which I uh, made on a um, second order uh, polynomial forecast. And on the bottom hand, you have the um, the application of the climate plan. So here you can see in green, it's only electric cars. So here we really can see that the, they will be dominating the market in the future if the climate plan is applied. Uh, on the contrary to, um, to the polynomial forecast, even though you have like a 600% increase in, in um, electric cars by 2050, um, it really uh, is minimal uh, compared to, to um, to cars that are uh, less, uh, yeah, emission emitting and 
compared to, to what we have today, but uh, still uh, fuel powered cars. So it's not uh, zero emissions in the future. Um, concerning um, emissions, what it would look like, you can see here on the, on the right hand side. So you have for the whole, for, for the year 2020 to 2030 every year step. And then I, uh, I do a leap of uh, 10 years, so 2040 and 2050. Um, what's interesting to see is that um, the application zone is only that red zone. So you can really see here that emissions are really decreasing in that zone, but it's it's not as easy as that because you can't really say, um, of course, on my territory, I'm reducing emissions, I'm fine. Um, you also need to take into account um, emissions that are around, around that area. Um, so you really need to put in place um, collaborations between the different areas, between the city of Paris and the surrounding uh, region in order to get a coherent picture and that's not that uh, drop in inside uh, the city by itself. For the tertiary sector, um, we have um, in the city's climate plan, um, there's not much about the, the tertiary mitigation actions. Um, but in France, we have uh, the national law that um, requires to um, a renovation of buildings that are more than uh, 1,000 uh, square meters. And uh, so they want to have uh, the reductions of 40, 50, and 60% for the different years compared to 2010. Um, we we took that uh, mitigation target because it's more fierce than what the city wanted to put in place. So um, we also tried to see um, so on on what kind of uh, of tertiary uh, sector uh, it will be uh, mostly impacted. So in in Paris, what we have is that uh, offices are really the most driving. Um, yeah emissions in, in, in terms of uh, they are occupying the, the biggest um, space and also they are having the highest energy consumption. Although if you look at it on a um, per square meter scale, then it's really um, the sport um, sector within the uh, tertiary sector that's really, um, yeah, driving emissions. So this really indicates where you can concentrate on, on different scales, on which kind of sectors or subsectors you can concentrate on to, um, to target um, your mitigation actions. So on the spatial scale, we'll try to see where uh, those uh, tertiary sectors will be mostly concentrated. Um, so you can see, yes, in the city center, um, it's mostly, and then you, you can see with the law of the 1000 square meter um, buildings, we have a more scattered picture. Um, so the the application of the climate plan is more, yeah, more scattered. Um, and in terms of emissions, so you can see here on the right hand side, uh, the emissions for 2020, 2030 and 2050, how they will evolve in the tertiary sector if that um, national law is really applied. Um, and here I'm almost finished. Um, you have the uh, the total emissions for the city of Paris and the surrounding area, so the metropolitan area. And what you really see here is the spatial heterogeneity of emission reduction. So on the, on the top panel, you have um, the emissions from the baseline 2020. And then if the uh, climate plan from Paris is applied as for the different uh, mitigation actions that I just mentioned for the different sectors, um, so you really can see that there's a nice decrease, but not a homogeneous decrease, which is really yeah, something that we need to keep in mind. And uh, on the bottom, you have the absolute difference on the left-hand side and the relative difference where you can see that uh, it's really Paris and it's the very closest surrounding area that's mostly impacted by the mitigation actions that are in the climate plan. So really reinforcing what I already said um, to have that collaboration between the different areas, um, administrative areas to, to have a co more coherent picture of uh, emission reductions for 2030. So small take home and messages. Um, so our cities are on track towards the climate targets. Um, yes, cities are heading the right directions, but 
it's they are not there yet. So we need to to increase the speed of uh, of putting in place the mitigation actions. We need to be more faithful um, towards uh, taking that actions and then trying to have a higher impact. Then uh, how far are um, climate plants influencing the um, spatial distribution of um, of emissions? Um, we have just seen that uh, we have a spatial heterogeneity across the different metropolitan areas. If it was for Paris or Munich, um, you have that spatial difference. So that really needs to be taken into account for any future atmospheric network. Um, you need to consider those uh, future GG emissions, those changes, and um, not only in the plain uh, urban extensions, but also different approaches such as um, socio-economic um, changes that are driving uh, your emissions on your territory. Um, what we wanted to do next is really to define that optimal um, atmospheric urban monitoring network. Um, we want to see what kind of network, what we really need in terms of precision, in terms of number of, um, of sensors, um, um, the sensibility of the sensor, because uh, the further we go along, um, the smaller the changes will be in the future. So um, are we actually able to track those uh, small changes in emissions with an um, atmospheric monitoring network? Or do we need other other devices or, or those hybrid approaches? And, and then we also want to see um, um, to go beyond uh, European cities, so uh, we want to try to include other cities, for example, uh, in, in the US, um, we try to work with uh, Los Angeles to see um, how far is this scalable to other cities. So that was it from my side. Um, any questions are welcome, and I think we have time for, for discussion. Well, thank you very much, Yvonne. That was a uh, very interesting talk, and uh, thanks for taking time to uh, present your results to us. Well, I would like to open the floor. Is there any um, question from uh, the participants in the chat? So far, I have seen no question. Should I stop the sharing so we can see all the participants? Or Yes, sure. Yeah, we can do that. Well, I have to, um, I have a question and, <clears throat> well, probably I'm talking a little bit for Amivu as well here. Um, we have Zurich as well in the pilot cities. Um, mm -hmm. Your study is in not including Zurich. Uh, I know it is probably uh, just because of time and, and resources uh, that we couldn't, but my question would be, um, well, first, at Amevu, um, I guess it will be of interest for Zurich. Um, and then back to Yvonne, well, how difficult is it now, once you have done this work, uh, to apply it to another city? Well, before we go to Los Angeles, you know, can we make a little project for Zurich, kind of, um, you know, is there a list of things you need to know and then you can apply your method uh, or is, is i guess it is not a finished service or tool but you know how easy is it to to apply to another city i think zurich is um is very much advanced in uh, what we would need in order to have that same kind of approach um what you need is what what I showed you, and I think we have a lot of uh, information already on that. We have we need to have a spatialized inventory that we do have with the TNO, and the city itself already has a very um, detailed uh, inventory um, that we need in order to have a baseline, right? And then you have to have um, a good idea of the mitigation actions, of the quantification of the mitigation actions that are mentioned in the climate plan. That is sometimes more tricky because as you have seen um, in Munich, they did that effort in trying to, uh, to have their own quantification of what their mitigation actions would bring in terms of um, GHG emission reductions. Um, this has not been done in Paris, for example. So the, the um, 
the workload was uh, much, much higher. Um, so I, I don't know how far uh, Zurich is on, on that. Um, but if we have that kind of information, um, then the, the spatialization and the, yeah, the view of uh, future emissions, um, it would be interesting to have uh, few, um, yeah, future projections about uh, the evolution of the city. Uh, like I said, um, socioeconomic differences. Um, do you have uh, any, uh, any special um, projects that uh, you should need to take into account, like uh, residential areas, like I mentioned, for example, in Munich, um, stuff like that. That's interesting. That's really driving um, emission changes in the futures. Um, that's that's interesting to take into account and to see and to spatialize in order to have a um, a more precise picture for the spatialization of future emissions and to have that uh, optimal design um, for the network. Thank you. But I, I have a question. Speaking. Yes. <laughs> I have a question. If it's okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I wonder when you use the inventories. Uh, how do you count emissions that are non-fossil emissions? Is that is that due to? I mean, is that not emissions, or is that emissions when you use inventories? You mean biogenic um, emissions? Yes. Yes. For now, I don't take into account any uh, biogenic uh, differences. So I, I did not do the, for example, the count of uh, the city wants to plant, uh, I don't know, a hundred or a thousand uh, trees, and how much uh, would that lead into um, emission reductions? Um, that's a whole, uh, um, yeah, study by itself. Like I said, um, if you don't have that kind of information of the quantification of the mitigation actions, it's really time consuming to have a quantification of each action item. So I, for now, concentrated on the biggest impacting mitigation actions. No, I, I mean more that if you use uh, uh, biofuel instead of fossil fuel. Oh. I mean, how is that? How does that come into account? Or if it's... Uh, if it is uh, gas or if it's uh, oil or I mean, is there any difference in of what is really emitted and how the inventory is saying that you don't have to account for? I mean, if okay, you so <laughs> the way it's taken into account is through the emissions inventory. So yes, we do have, uh, I showed the slide from the traffic sector in Paris where we have that information about how many cars um, are in the streets that uh, are uh, divided by each one of their energy source. So we have that kind of information, what kind of energy sources each car is using. Um, so there we do take into account the, the use of biofuels. Um, and we also did take that into account in order to see uh, future projections. So it's really through the emissions inventory. Um, through the atmospheric network, like I said, oh, we need to see um, what kind of network we would need um, to to be able to change to see those very small changes in emissions and and to yeah to go down to that uh, uh, detail of saying uh, my emission changes that I'm measuring uh, are really attributable to uh, the use of, of biofuel sources. Um, We'll see. <laughs> okay, I have a question, Claudio, if that's okay. Hello? Okay, yes, sure. I was talking oh. to a muted microphone. Susan, yeah. please go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Yvonne, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering if the if you are, um, there are solutions on the market for cities to visualize the inventories and the climate plans that they have. Um, I'm working with a company, Enersys, and they have this module CO2 buildings where you actually have a dashboard where you can see the three-dimensional uh, city maps and they can plan, for example, if we would change the energy uh, uh, provision of that part of the city from gas to renewable, that would have an effect on the emissions of so-and-so. 
Uh, what okay. do you see is the main difference between what you now developed and the things which are already there? I did not know this kind of tool. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, I, I was not aware. Uh, so what you have is, is uh, restricted to the residential sector or it's all taking well, into account all sectors? Uh, it's in taking into account all sectors, but I have to say for the for the visualization of this energy thing, that's mainly residential, but they, the plan itself and the dashboard would include all the activities. But I can okay. share the information afterwards. It would be really interesting to see yes. where you see the, the main differences in assets because your product, of course, is very interesting in my view for cities because you very nicely visualize um, what they have and what they plan and what the differences are i think that's still still not not available in such an extent no so. yeah for now uh, i was not aware like i said um that something existed uh, kind of like that uh, already um yeah i think that's what's missing right now um yeah. with the company with the startup that i'm working with origins earth um, they also provide um, that kind of service for the cities mm -hmm. so they have that emission inventory um same on a 3D uh, view. They have a very nice dashboard. You can also play with the scenarizations, and uh, they are taking into account a whole, uh, yeah, huge uh, amount of databases in order to construct uh, the emission inventories um, to be very. Um, to be. Um, Yvonne, you are breaking up, I think. Okay. Can you hear you? Oh, okay. you're back. Okay, good. Um, maybe can you repeat the last two sentences? I think there was a bad connection somewhere. Okay. Was it from my side, the bad connection? Sorry. I, I don't know. Um, so what I said is that, uh, yeah, I uh, what I know is that uh, Origins Earth is also providing that kind of service. Um, so what you just said, they have a, a very high resolution spatial scale and also um, temporal resolution. So they have the emission inventory up to last month. Um, and they also provide that service, what you just said, uh, for scenarization. So you can play with the different emissions to see what the, what you might have in the future. Um, I'd really be interested to have a look at uh, what you already have to see how it differs uh, with uh, what I'm providing. But I think in general, this is something what uh, what is um, yeah might need in order to really see like, like for example, in the traffic sector, um, it's really harsh to applicate to say um, uh, we want to have uh, no more uh, thermal powered cars in on our territory, right? But if you apply that, for example, when you have the uh, the Greater Paris region only on seven percent of that uh, territory, of course, uh, in the end, it's only driving like a, a third of the reductions that you actually wanted to have. So. It's really interesting to have that kind of tool to really see the, the implication in the future. Thank you. But yeah, you can I'm maybe just put my email and then um, you can write me and yeah, contact me and I'd love to, to hear more about that. Thank you very much. Um, then we have maybe, well, we are running short on time now, but uh, one last question, uh, which is in the chat, uh, Yvonne, from uh, Gia, yeah. about uh, emission per person spatially visualized, I guess. I think that would be possible, yes, of course, I know it's difficult to have a spatial reserve population density. Yeah, that's that would be the the biggest question i guess uh, the spatial results uh, population density but um of course you can you can go by proxies right um having information of the residential sector um the, the tertiary sector etc that are really uh, placing people uh, wherever they live or work um so i think uh, that that could be possible and might be interesting to see. Of course, um, then goes into the question of, uh, do you include, for example, tourists, something like that? Uh, where do you place them? How much? Uh, 
um, yeah, is it only 20% or is it more? And um, yeah, but it would be interesting to see. And I think possible. Yeah, thank you, Yvonne, for this answer, yes. Well, that actually brings me to another question. Um, is there any um, thought of involving big events in cities? For example, the Olympics in Paris. Exactly. Um, yes, I think um, this is something um, that, that is really interesting to take into account. I think I might have a look uh, as a next step for that because they also issued a um, um, what what I showed you for Munich um, in their local urbanization plan. Um, actually, Paris uh, issued a special issue um, for the Olympics to uh, to to show what they are planning to to construct, etc., in order to have the permits. And um, yeah, it would be interesting to see uh, how much uh, it's actually um, influencing future emissions and and also on the spatial scale. And there are so many uh, questions. Uh, <laughs> Hard to read that answer. Uh, are they aware of the difference between the tendency of the action versus the target? So yes, we are in contact with uh, with both of the cities in Paris and Munich. Um, we did. I did not uh, do a uh, a personalized uh, presentation for each of the city to to tell them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. You're here, and this is where you want to be. Um, they are. Uh, they're aware of the study, um, but uh, yeah, for now it kind of ends there because also they have other stuff to do. And but I think this is something we, which we need to plan. We need to plan a, a meeting with them and then to see, um, uh, yeah, to have a, a yeah a discussion about it. Because I'm also not pretending to have included everything, et cetera. You know, like you can also always attack uh, any kind of study to say, yeah, yes, but um, <laughs> so uh, it needs to be to, to open a discussion. That's what it should do. <laughs>